I have another book to review tonight. Um, I picked up this book. It's called The Writer's Castle. And it's Reporting History at Nuremberg. And it's by Uwe Neumar. Um, the reason I picked up this book is I just wanted to see what, what was the aftermath of the Second World War. And the situation. Um, the Allies and Russia had overrun Germany. Hitler had committed suicide Hit, al along with Himmler and um, the Nazi party had scattered and the Allies had um, taken over Germany and um, they had what was left of the Nazi party. Um, they wanted to make a trial uh, to show to the world the consequences of uh, the Nazi party's doing in Germany. Um, they decided to pick the city of Nuremberg in Germany. Nuremberg was razed to the ground during uh, the Second World War, but the community hall that was there, the city hall that was there was intact, and they decided that it would be the best place to hold uh, the trials of those, uh, uh, those uh, defendants in that city on account of the fact that Nuremberg was, in a way, the birthplace of Nazism. There was a lot of monster rallies, uh, pro-Nazi rallies were held in Nuremberg. And so it was decided that Nuremberg would be the best place uh, to bring an end to the Nazi question. Um, so what happened was, um, Goring was probably the highest uh, member of the Nazi party who was captured uh, along with about 20 others, uh, ministers for uh, production, high-ranking government officials, uh, German generals like uh, Jodl and Keitel was among them, uh, and uh, who else? Uh, um, Hess, I think it was as well. So the Allies and Russia had come to the conclusion that... Um, by having a trial, this trial would create a precedent so that they could, uh, international law could be established and it would be a preventative way of stopping any further um, evil atrocities that were witnessed in the Second World War. And it was hoped it would bring an end to all of this. Um, Unfortunately, as we can see today, um, we didn't really learn those lessons well. Um, from the technical side of the Nuremberg rallies, or the Nuremberg trials, um, what happened was, was uh, the legal team of the Allies in Russia, they, um, the, the, the sheer vastness of the crimes, of the evil that was, um, that was done, uh, by the Nazis during the Second World War was so immense that they had to split it into four categories. And I think the four categories was, one was genocide, um, destruction of peace, um, uh, um, uh, crimes against humanity, and I can't think of what the fourth one was. Um, and what they wanted to do was they would have, um, um, they had an opening, um, it was Robert Johnson, he was the, the eminent, um, he was the lead um, um, uh, prosecution, uh, he's from America and he opened it up with um, an incredible speech and um, he really hit the nail on the head. Uh, there was no doubt that the Nazi party was responsible for all the crimes and atrocities that was committed. There was no way that those defendants were going to be able to defend themselves. Neither could they, no matter what kind of sentence that was going to be handed over to these people, they could never fully shoulder the immense crimes that had been committed. How could they? They couldn't. It, it, it was just, it was um, evil on a, in an incredible scale. So, uh, what happened was uh, after the after the the prosecution started, um, over the course of something like two years, uh, the trials ran, 
um, they were a pretty, um, they were a dry affair in so far as there was an awful lot of paperwork that had to be um, read out and there had to be a charge, there had to be a counter charge, there had to be a process, uh, there would have to be due process that had to be done. Um, one of the big things about the, tri the trials was the technology that they had at the time. Um, they had translators. Um, all everybody was wearing earphones. Uh, they were able to listen to uh, the, the the trials in English, Russian, French, and German. And uh, the thing about that was, like an English word, if if the if if uh, Goring was to say something in German, the when it's translated into English, it might come off slightly different from what uh, Goring was saying and of course if it was tra retranslated into French or into Russian again you could see straight away that there would have been a lot of inaccuracies in terms of uh, what uh, everybody was hearing uh, from the one uh, source so it, it was incumbent on the translators in the Nure Nuremberg trials to really really understand um, legal uh, terminology, medical terminology, all sorts of terminologies and to be able to accurately and very very quickly translate what they were hearing to the people that, that, that were trying to uh, understand what was being said. So um, it, was quite a, it was quite a feat, quite a technological feat and uh, furthermore where words literally could not describe um, the atrocities they had to uh, revert to motion pictures and there was a lot of um, um, a lot of clips videos of uh, the, the, the the atrocities that were witnessed in the death camps and the concentration camps uh, displaced persons and all that horror and tragedy and vileness um, all of that would end up uh, being played out in the courts throughout that. And over all of that, the journalists would then have to pick out the best bits of it or try to make sense of it as best they could and uh, write it into reports so that the, those reports could be in the newspapers internationally. And that's the whole purpose of this uh, book. It's all about the journalists and the journalists' experience in um, reporting and recording uh, the Nuremberg trials. Um, from the start, um, um, there was the, you had the uh, you had the American reporters, you had the British reporters, you had the French and the German and you had the Russian reporters and they all had their own various styles and one thing that I picked up from the book was the Western style um, they could do it they could report whatever the way they wanted to if they wanted to be satirical they could be satirical um, they were if they were disparaging they were disparaging um, in general um, the Western uh, journalists uh, tended towards an extremist form of journalism and it was called Van Sittartism and uh, what, what that was was basically back before the Second War World War started Neville Chamberlain the Prime Minister of Britain when um, decided to go across and negotiate with Hitler uh, and um, it was Baron Von Sittart uh, who was opposed to Neville Chamberlain going across and trying to make a deal on the grounds that uh, Van Sittert had um, his view of the Germans were that they were militaristic, barbarian, you couldn't deal with them, you couldn't trust them. And so a lot of the writers uh, from the West uh, had this element of extremist hardline viewpoint that the Germans were bad, that's the end of that, uh, don't trust them. So even in, in their uh, reports, they would talk about, um, they would talk very uh, disparagingly of uh, the Germans and they would talk up um, the prosecution side uh, 
and um, and the proceedings. Um, another thing that I uh, uh, realized there there was a there was a communist there was French communist journalists and they they couldn't um, if they wanted to they would well they they could not. Uh, they they could only write in a particular form of journalism. Um, it was uh, they had to toe the communist line, and what I got from that communist line was basically that communist communism is good. Um, we have to prove it to everybody, and we're going to be communist anyway. And uh, that particular message was the same. Uh, that particular type of journalism was used throughout uh, in Russia after the Second World War. I'd imagine it was the same throughout the Cold War and after the Cold War. And uh, it do, I would say that it does reflect in military Russian military bloggers uh, today in the Ukraine war. It's a kind of um, Russia against the world, but Russia is going to win anyways. That sort of uh, journalism. They, they do genuinely, uh, they're, they're writing in such a way that they believe that victory is going to be theirs in the end, whatever way it goes. Um, uh, what else could I say about the journalism? Um, two journalists that, that really um, struck a chord with me were the two German journalists, um, uh, Kastner and Mendelssohn. Kastner and Mendelssohn were both re world-renowned um, German writers um, before uh, the Second World War. And what had happened was um, Mendelssohn, on account of the fact that he was Jewish, he had to leave Germany. So he ended up having to uh, report about what was going on in his home country, uh, what was going on in Germany, uh, even though he was living in England. And um, that struck a chord with me because right now there's a lot of Ukrainian um, bloggers who who can't uh, stay in Ukraine. They're living in Europe as we speak. Uh, one that comes to mind is Denis Davidoff. And uh, the correlation between himself and Mendelssohn is the fact that sheer frustration of uh, knowing what's going on in their beloved country and the pain of not being able to fully express what's actually happening in their country you know, you know they they're outside they're insiders who want to report on the inside but they're on the outside they can they can't they can't stay in their own country so they have this kind of the pain and frustration of not being able to report what's in their hearts and they truly believe that they should be in their own country reporting from their own country but they can't um on the other side you have Kastner Willy Kastner he uh he stayed in Germany throughout uh, the second world war and uh, what I get from him, he, he ended up, he had to um, toe the Nazi line. He had to, uh, he ended up uh, publishing uh, books during that time. And he was, um, he was involved with filmmaking at the time as well. He did take part in uh, what was going on in literally, literary life in Germany. But of course, you can tell straight away, that like he was under pain of death, you know, he, he could not write from his heart. He could not write what was actually happening around him because if he did, it would uh, probably mean the loss of his own life or the life of his own family. So those two writers did end up uh, meeting each other at the Nuremberg Trials and both of them, they, they, they had a friendship between each other uh, Mendelssohn pressed Kastner to um, write about his experiences in um, Germany at the time and Kastner said that he would but in the end he never did and uh, instead what he ended up writing was uh, children's books 
lice, lice, licest of lice um, literary um, publications. Um, I can only imagine um, the pain and the trauma that he must have been experiencing. Even the thought of writing about what he had to go through during those dark, dark days in um, Germany during the Second World War. Uh, he, he never he never wrote about them. Uh, can I, I can totally understand why. Um, what more can I say about it? Um, again, during uh, the trials, uh, the most notable, uh, um, again, the trials themselves were pretty dry, but um, there was a couple of um, um, high points, you could say there was. Um, for a start, uh, Goring, uh, Hermann Goring, he was the writing marshal of the Luftwaffe. And uh, when he was arrested, he was overweight, he was drugged, he was a drug addict. Um, he was not in very good shape, he was in very poor shape. However, um, when he was fit for trial, um, he, um, the medical personnel had uh, got him into shape. And he was in incredible form. He was highly intelligent. He knew what was going on. Um, when, um, the reporters, the journalists, uh, every day the journalists would be reporting on what he was uh, thinking and saying. And he was he did take a lead part in the defendant's uh, row. He kept the other defendants in line. He um, tried to keep control of them. As best he could, whereas um, some people he couldn't control. But um, the point was, he came across as a very intelligent and sharp witted um, uh, defendant. Um, there was a cross examination of Goring. Um, normally, it would have been to the chief prosecutor to prosecute him, but the head prosecutor, Robert. Um, um, what was his name? Robert. Uh, Robert, the head prosecutor, uh, uh, cross-examined him. And he, the, uh, the, throughout that particular um, cross-examination, it was generally viewed that Goring had the upper hand on um, Robert, that he was able to uh, contradict him. Uh, he was able to manipulate the truth in such a way that it made look. Uh, he he was able to catch um, catch him catch the lead prosecutor out on uh, technical uh, terminology, and um, in general, the journalists um, viewed it that Goring was uh, the better at it, and that reflects on the podcast that I had about Trump there a few weeks back. It also reflects back on other podcasts that I did on evil people. These people are extremely intelligent. And when when I think about it, I wonder is highly intelligent, kind of like a misnomer, on the grounds that um, it's through sheer quirk of whatever happened in their background. If they were, if had they been brought up in better circumstances, they would have gone on to become renowned business people, politicians, president of the United States of America. You know, they're so sharp and they're so intelligent and they, they, they have that approach where they can charm you into thinking that um, their way is the better way. And they make you feel like that their truth is the best, the ultimate truth. And they never deny um, they never say that. Uh, they never call a defeat. They never. Uh, they never realize a defeat. Um, it's that car sort of mentality that's in them, and throughout any dictators or um, top uh, gang leaders or whatever, you find the same sort of characteristics. They're charming. They manipulate the truth, and they make you feel like they're actually right and you're not. Um, what more can I say about him? Uh, Goring committed suicide before he was hanged. How that happened, we don't know. But I can only imagine he managed to influence somebody into um, giving him a quick uh, die out. 
Um, furthermore, uh, what else can I say about this? Uh, the Americans, um, there was a, a lot of female reporters uh, involved in the Nuremberg trials and um, it was very difficult for them because it was a male, it's a, it's a man's world back then and um, most notably uh, there was a case where one of the journalists uh, one of the female journalists she actually managed to stow aboard uh, one of the ships uh, at the D-Day landings and she was able to give uh, first hand accounts of the D-Day landings uh, she had to masquerade as a nurse uh, to get on board a ship uh, but she managed to do it um, again um, it was very difficult for female journalists back in those days. Um, another uh, prominent journalist that was in the book, um, her um, her ex husband happened to be Ernest Hemingway, and um, both of them happened to be reporting to the same newspaper at the same time, and of course there was friction between them on account of that. What more can I say? Um, also, uh, there's a good description of the German people um, throughout the book, throughout the trials. Um, one, some points that I rem recall from it um, was the fact that the German people in, in Nuremberg, um, when you found them, they were immaculately dressed. They looked after their appearance and uh, then when it was time for them to go home uh, home was literally uh, going in, down a little hole into a basement a dank cellar and uh, you know for for them um, they were not really concerned about uh, the Nuremberg trials they were more concerned about the fact that they were starving that they didn't know where were they where were they going to get their next meal or drink of water from uh, for them uh, it was survival especially in the first few months of um, uh, of Germany surrendering um, their their life was very uh, on the balance um, their lives were very threatened at the time um, they did not know who to trust they could uh, you know the, the, there was atrocities being done to them while um while they were being occupied, um you know there was a lot of retribution going on at the time. Um, later on, uh, they were described as solipsist, in so far as they only could care about themselves. They had uh, lost everything. They had lost their property. They had lost their principles and values. They had lost their government, their institutions. They didn't know who to believe anymore. So literally, they retreated into themselves and they'd only live and think about themselves. So whenever journalists were pressing them uh, for comments about um, the concentration camps or things like that, um, they were very you know non-responsive to those kind of uh, kind of questions based mainly on the fact that they were starving and they were they could only think about themselves really but later on um it became a collective mentality amongst the people they had to um you know they had to repress all their emotions uh, despite everything that they had to repress during the during the times that the Nazis were in charge, now they had to repress even further uh, because they were now a conquered nation. So um, it, it was uh, a lot of uh, journalists felt that they were right in Vincitartism, in in accusing the German people of being evil and uh, not worth um, caring about. But reality was was um, they were shell shocked and they had their own PTSD at the time, and um, later on um, when they were um, being uh, when they were under administration, um, there would be posters of concentration camps and big messages saying German people did this, you know. Um, but uh, after a few months uh, later, they stopped that kind of thing because it wasn't actually helping the Germans uh, to get over to them, get over 
they had to get through their own grieving process, I suppose. And um, it's uh, because they retreated into themselves and they started doing what they were told and working towards a better future. Uh, consequent generations were able to be more amenable and kinder and most all general all german people i've ever met have been so kind and so thoughtful and empathetic and sympathetic and it's probably down to the fact that there was a generational um ptsd that uh, that the trauma that happened some 75 80 years ago still lingers in their conscience and um they need to be respected for that um on top of that um what happened to those defendants uh, most of them got uh, the, the most of them were hanged uh, some of them managed to get life sentences and um the last uh, the last um person there was one last prisoner, his name was Hess, and he was released back in 1960. He was released from Spandau prison on account of the fact that he was the only prisoner there and it was costing the German government millions to keep him there. And he was in his 80s, so he, was, he wasn't going to uh, cause any more trouble. Um, for the likes of Hess, though, um, uh, as, as a Nazi party, um, member he was um he was very loyal to hitler uh, however he made the mistake of um going to scotland uh, during the second world war he he flew over to scotland he was captured in scotland and the purpose of his flight was to go over to the british government and try to convince them to surrender to the germans so um that was his war um so overall, um, I liked. Uh, I I find there's a lot of um, there's a lot of um, relation between uh, what happened in Nuremberg and what's happening in um, Russia today, and um, the consequences of uh, um, um, a country capitulating. Um, what happens to their people and how do they react? To this sort of thing um it was a fantastic read it was a long read it was a tough read um but in terms of uh, military enthusiast uh, it was a, an interesting read something that um, should be considered when it comes to military enthusiasm is the consequences of war because at the end of the day uh, as a military enthusiast i'm not about war i'm out i'm, I'm about keeping peace uh, and being prepared for. That's all I have to say. Take care.